Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Go ahead and turn to Numbers 13. That'll be our, our text today. This is actually our back to school Sunday. You can probably tell by all these hands that are up here. These, these hands, uh, each one of them has a name written on it. It's, it's one of our kids. And what we're going to ask you to do this morning is after worship, or if you get bored in the middle of the sermon, just come on up here, grab one of these. And when you're doing that, you're committing to praying for this kid. This is Parker. Parker's mine right here. So lots of prayers. Is that correct, Forrest? Lots of prayers. Okay. Um, but we do this just because our, as our kids start back to school, they're moving into some new territory, uh, new classes, new teachers, new classmates. Um, it can be a time of, of stress and anxiety, maybe. It can be a time of testing of their character. Uh, they're going to be going through a lot of things, so they need the prayers of their brothers and sisters. So uh, please come up and grab one of these after the service. Undiscovered country. That's what we're talking about this morning. Our children in school, they're moving into undiscovered country. They're moving into places they've never been before, uh, seeing things they haven't seen before, doing things they haven't done before. Um, it's it's going to be a new experience. For some of, it's not just the kids, some of you parents are moving into undiscovered country. Uh, some of your kids are going off, moving out of the house, going to college. Uh, maybe they're, they're going off into some new area of life. Maybe you're moving into a different area of life. How do you approach it as you move into new land? How do you approach it as you're moving into undiscovered country? That's what we're talking about. So milk and honey. Milk and honey is the, the idea uh, that as God was delivering the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, he was taking them to Canaan. And it was a place where they were going to live in houses they didn't build. They were going to harvest crops they didn't plant. God intended Canaan to be a place of prosperity and peace for them. And the descriptor, the descriptor there is, it is a land flowing with milk and honey, which means every good thing is coming your way. But before they could lay claim on Canaan, before it became a place of peace and prosperity, it was a place of battle. They were going to have to fight for what God wanted them to have. So, Moses has led them at the point in, in Numbers where we're getting to. Moses has led them out of Egypt. They've gone on that journey to Canaan. And they're standing on the cusp of Canaan's land. And God gives Moses a plan. He says, send some people in to check it out. So Moses picks one person from every tribe. And he gives them instructions. He says, go into the land, spy it out. Tell me what the cities are like. Are they fortified or not? What are the people like? Uh, what's, what are the crops like? If you can, bring back some of the fruit of the land. So these 12 men go into the land, into Canaan. They travel through it. They take 40 days. They take a while. Uh, they go from city to city. They explore. They, they spy out the land. And then in Numbers 13, we get the report. Look in verse 24. Oh, sorry, 25. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh, at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell, dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb, he was one of the men sent in. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is, as the land, is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who came from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. 
So the spies bring back a report. God wants them to have this place, but they're going to have to fight for it. They bring back the report and say, it's too much. There are too many people. The cities are too well fortified. They've got walls. They've got battlements. They're, they're prepared for trouble. More than that, those people are huge. They're the, the descendants of Anak, which were, were huge. The Nephilim, uh, they were, I'm going to say, supernaturally huge. Think Goliath. They're too big. We can't fight them. Caleb, who went in, he said, no, 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 no. We can do it. We can do it. We're well able to do it. Let's go take what God wants us to have. But the rest of them shout him down. And even though they're on the cusp of owning everything God wanted for them, their fear starts calling the shots. Uh, look at Numbers 14. I'm having, trouble on, I'm having a little trouble myself. Numbers 14, verse 29. Here we go. God gets mad at them. God is upset. He has prepared this for them. He has led them to it. He's going to be with them every step of the way. And they turn their backs on what God wanted them to have. Right, go ahead and verse 26 there. The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I've heard the grumblings of the people of Israel which they grumble against me. Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness. And of all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell. Except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, who you said would become prey, I will bring in. They shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness. And your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years. And you shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of days... In which you spied out the land forty days, a year for each day. You shall bear your iniquity forty years, and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this will I do in this, to all this wicked congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall come to a full end, and there they shall die. Forty years. They wouldn't grab hold of what God brought them to. He had blessing ready for the taking. But they got scared and they stopped looking at their God and they started looking at the troubles and they wouldn't grasp hold of it. And they were cursed to wander the wilderness for 40 years. What baffles me about this is these people had already seen with their own eyes what God could do. At this point, they had seen the, the plagues that he dropped upon Egypt. They, they knew his power. The Nile had turned to blood. Frogs, gnats, flies littered the land, overwhelmed the land. The livestock of Egypt died. Uh, boils broke out on the Egyptians. There was hail and locusts and darkness. And finally, the, the curse of God fell on the Egyptians. The death of the firstborn. With amazing and mighty power, God broke the will of the Egyptian Pharaoh and freed them from their chains of slavery. They saw all of it. They saw all of it. They didn't suffer from it. That's what's amazing. They, they were able to be spared while all the Egyptian slave masters were punished. And yet, they still didn't trust in God. They saw with their own eyes, each and every one of them, the pillar of cloud leading them out of Egypt by day and a pillar of fire leading them by night. They never had to doubt where they should go. All they had to do is wake up in the morning and go, hey, where's that pillar of cloud? There it is. God wants us to go that way. Follow that cloud. If they were traveling at night, follow that fiery pillar. They knew there was no doubt. I would that impress you much? That would blow me away. They saw with their own eyes and not only saw, but walked across dry land when God parted the Red Sea before them. They took those steps. They saw the water on either side. They walked on that dry ground to freedom and saw the water come crashing back to drown their enemies. 
They saw the power of God. Not only that, but each one of them had eaten of the manna that he had given them. God provided them miraculous fruit, food, angel bread, that every morning they could go out. They never had to worry about eating. They were never going to go hungry because God fed them. They, they, they saw and experienced God's deliverance, his justice established upon their enemies, his guidance and provision. Miraculously, powerfully, again and again and again. And yet, when they came to the border of Canaan, they would not enter. Even though they had the testimony of their own eyes to see the power that Jehovah God had, they would not trust in Him to do it again. They started looking at the size of their enemies. They started looking at the size of those cities and they backed down. Not all of them. Caleb wanted to go through with it. He said, let's go take it. They would not take hold of it. And God cursed them to wander the wilderness for 40 years. What a colossal waste. 40 years of wandering. And, and in that time, as they wandered through the wilderness, nomadic people, all they were doing was waiting for people to die off. And only when that last person died off could they enter the land. So that 40 years was pointless for them. They didn't prosper themselves any. They didn't gain anything. What a waste. If you were Caleb or Joshua, how frustrated would you be at that point? I'd be furious. You, you guys have just wasted 40 years of my life. I don't know what your patience level is, is like, but I get frustrated when I have to wait 40 seconds on the microwave to heat something up. 40 years they had to wait. When all that 40 years, they could have been kicking back in Canaan, enjoying life, being prosperous, and yet they just had to wander around. They were wilderness wanderers. Now, honestly, that, that phrase doesn't sound bad, does it? I wouldn't mind wandering in the wilderness a little bit. But it's no time to wander when God has something for you to do and when God wants to bless you. That's not the time to wander. That's not the time to choose fear over faith. When God has laid some blessing out for you, He wants you to lay hold of it. They wouldn't do it. I think in their hearts, they were still slaves. God had freed their bodies, but they wouldn't lay hold of that freedom and own it and claim it. And they suffered for it. And what God was doing was waiting for that generation to die off, everybody over 20. And what that meant was every fighting man, uh, for them, 20 to 40 was the fighting age for men. But he was waiting for all those people to die off until a whole new generation came up. And when that finally happened, that new generation had a different attitude. Uh, go ahead and turn. Let me, sorry, I'm, oh, there we go. Joshua 1. Turn to Joshua 1. They've come to the, the cusp of the promised land again. 40 years later. A whole new people. They get a, a new command here. Look in verse 10. Moses has died. Joshua is stepping into his role as leader. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Joshua says, let the call go out. Tell every Israelite, it's time. Get ready. Pack up your stuff. Get your provisions ready because in three days we're crossing the Jordan and we're taking what God wants us to have. What was their response? Go ahead and turn to uh, chapter 1, verse 16. And they answered Joshua, all that you have commanded us we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. 
Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and disobeys your words, whatever you commanded him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. They didn't mention a word about how big their enemies were. They didn't bring up how well fortified the cities were. They didn't, they, they didn't react with fear. They reacted with faith. They said, Joshua, whatever you say, we're going to do. They didn't repeat the mistakes of their ancestors. They'd been wandering for 40 years when they should have been celebrating. They were finally ready to take hold of what God wanted them to have. They said, we'll do it. Whatever you say, we're in. Not only that, but if anybody spreads this seed of doubt and fear in us, if they disobey what you're saying, we're killing them. Are they pretty serious about this? They're not messing around anymore. That, and the only thing they want from Joshua is not from him, for him to turn aside and not for him to give them what they want. The only they, thing they want from him is to be strong and courageous. They're saying, Joshua, we'll be the followers God deserves in this. You be the leader God is calling you to be. Lead us with strength and with courage, and we will take everything God wants us to have. They wouldn't be satisfied with wandering in the wilderness. They were ready to conquer Canaan. They were ready to live in those houses. They were ready to, to live as free men in their own nation. They're ready to prosper. They were, they're ready to thrive. They had had enough of wandering in the wilderness. And even though them entering into that land meant battle had to be waged, they were going into it with faith and trust in God. You have an option in your life of how you're going to live it. You can be a wilderness wanderer. You can act out of fear. You can be hesitant timid and doubtful and you can refuse to lay hold of the claim uh, of the blessings God wants you to have or you can live out of faith and step boldly into undiscovered country it's your call but let me tell you this there are things that God wants for you there there are blessings that God has laid up for you and he wants you to have them. Someday you're going you're gonna to pass away and you're going to leave an inheritance to your kids, right? Do you want your kids to have that inheritance or somebody else to have that inheritance? You want that for your children. You want them to benefit from the good things that you have stored up. You want them to lay claim to every part of it. You don't want them to go, ah, I, don't, I don't want that. I don't want those 640 acres. I don't need that. You want them to grab hold of the blessings you want them to have. In the same way, God wants you to have everything he wants you to have. They owned Canaan. God had already said it. It's yours. It, essentially, they had the deed to the land, but they wouldn't claim it. I own a lot of things that I haven't laid claim to. Uh, if you go to my house, there's a big library of books. And don't tell Courtney, but I haven't read every book in that library. I own it, but I haven't claimed it. Like there's, there's richness to be gained in those books that I haven't laid hold of. And I think Tatum, it was you that told me a while back, there's two different hobbies, reading books and buying books. They're completely different hobbies. Uh, God wants you to lay claim of it. Lay claim to everything he wants you to have. It's not enough for you to own it if you don't get the richness out of it. And God has some richness that he wants you to have. Most of us don't get the benefit of the richness of the family of God that we should. There are deep blessings in being a part of Christ's church. Just in the people Blessings of encouragement and comfort and help that God wants you, you personally, to lay claim to. But a lot of times we hold ourselves at arm's length. 
A lot of times we don't want to get close because that may entail some commitment we're not ready for. Maybe we hold ourselves apart because we've been hurt by somebody else. But God has richness in store just in the body alone if you'll lay claim to it. Probably every single one of you has a Bible, if not multiple Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, come find me after this and I'll get you a Bible. But, but you may have the Word of God, but are you getting the richness from the Word of God that God wants you to have? And there is goodness in the Bible. There is strength to be found. There is faith to be built. There is hope to be discovered in the Word of God. But if you own it, but don't read it, study it, meditate on it, you're not going to get that blessing. God has, has blessings of peace and patience and kindness and goodness and love that He wants you to find he wants you to lay claim to. He wants you to fight for if you'll do it. Most of us Christians, we live far beneath our privilege. God has privileged you to be his son, his daughter, with a wealth of things that would deeply and powerfully enrich your life if you'll fight for it, if you'll lay claim to it, if you'll strive for it. But, that all depends on your, your, your attitude. Are you content to wander in the wilderness? Or are you eager to be a Canaan conqueror? What are you going to do? Listen, we, and I'll say this, it doesn't just affect you. It's not just about you. It's about a whole lot of other people too. When we don't do this, when we choose timidity over faith, when we're content to just wander if we're not diving into the deep things of God, if we're not truly experiencing all the joy and peace and hope that He is laying out for us, listen, that means the people that are in your life aren't going to see God very clearly. Or what they are going to see is that somebody who's a godly person uh, lives a pale, timid, fearful life. And God wants a lot more for them than that. But if you don't lay claim to it, they're never going to see an example of somebody laying claim to it, so they may not claim it themselves. When we do it, when we're not satisfied uh, with the superficial things, if we're, if we're boldly going into the deeper things, then the people around us are going to see it, and they're going to see God, and they're going to see Jesus, and God has a far greater chance of reaching them to save their soul. I want to say this this morning. People, don't be content with a little. Don't be, in fact, be discontent. Did, did I phrase that right? Be discontented. Don't be happy with a little. Lay hold of everything God wants you to have. Let, that, let a hunger build in you, a desire to grab hold of everything God has on the table for you and not stop and get it all. Lay out for it. Struggle for it. Strive for it. And when you do that, God will enrich your life in ways you never saw before. But it will never happen when you're acting out of fear. It only happens when you fully lean on faith. That's my message this morning. If anybody has any need of help, if they need prayers, if they need encouragement, if they need to put Jesus on in baptism, please come forward while we stand and sing.